What's up, y'all? We're here with the legendary Richie Rich on Music Realm Television in Oakland, California. Man, it's a blessing to catch up with the legend, man. How's everything going with you, though? Man, man I'm hanging like wallpaper sticking like a little fire, you know, man. I'm just trying to keep it G. Yeah, it does. What's up? For sure. Man, it's a blessing to finally catch up with you, man. I've been out, you know, from Detroit to, to the Bay and finally got to you, man. And uh, it's, it's, been a, it's a, been a tough one, but we finally got with you. Hey, man, I'm be honest with you, man. I mean, it's... It's always a it's like looking for Bigfoot. You know what I'm talking about? It's been sightings, it's been rumors, they've seen footprints. <laughs> but to actually catch the beast that <laughs> get him on film, it's Man. hard to do, you feel me? Man, it's very hard. So we got some few questions for the blogs and everybody who sent us emails and we just had some questions and stuff and we gonna see what uh, see what you gotta say and just get a little more, get to know you a little more than what on the surface. For sure, you know what I mean? So uh, so some people wanted to know who inspires you to be a rapper. It's funny you asked me that. I was just telling uh I was just telling my chick, like we was in the backyard listening to some old school shit. My brother is the one that turned me out. You know what I mean? Like, I ain't no young nigga. I'm an older nigga, but my brother used to listen to like old school New York hip hop. You know what I mean? Curtis Ball. Uh, we used to listen to Count Cool Out, DMC, uh, Sugar Hill Gang. Like, all that's the shit that turned me out. Sweeney G. Like, them the niggas who I heard first. You know what I mean? That's back when niggas were making songs that 15, 20 minutes long, so flowing. I learned that from there. You know what I mean? Me being a West Coast nigga. And niggas get mad when I say this, but New York niggas is the first niggas that I saw rapping. And they was the niggas that inspired me. We was talking, I was talking about that earlier with my boy T Stacks, and we were saying the same thing, because he was saying rap started on the West Coast. I said, no, nah, it started on the East Coast, but it wasn't like he said it started there, but it was kind of a twist up, because the younger generation, they think some of the music started here, but it really like started on the East Coast. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, LL Cool J, EPMD, uh, Rock Kim and Eric B. Them was like the niggas that I grew up listening to. Them was the coldest niggas, you know what I mean? We had your run DMCs. And that's before it was West Coast niggas rapping, uh, Easy E, Mice T, different niggas. Yeah. But what they was on was more like a gangbang type shit. And I'm from Oakland, you know we're the back from here. So Oakland to me is like the Harlem of the Bay Area. So the fresh niggas, one thing about New York niggas, I always give up, them niggas have always been like fresh. All them niggas, they've been about their table. And it was the first niggas I heard rap. So who was the niggas who inspired me to rap? It's crazy you bring up the, uh, the Los Angeles rappers, you know, like I see and stuff. And he was looking at an interview with Snoop Dogg, and uh, he was saying the reason why he parked his two or three with Warren G and Nick Dogg is because of Richie Rich had a group called Four and Five, and he loves your style. Shout out Snoop Dogg, shout out Warren, rest in peace, Nick Dogg. Those are my guys. Like, um, Snoop and Warren was two of the first cats who actually told me that the first day she was on the phone, she was on the phone. And it was something for me to hear a nigga on Snoop's level was a fan of mine. But then it was kept the hunting. He was like, we used to listen to the phone. She was on the strap. She said, one day, nigga, we was like, fuck it, nigga, we used to listen to the phone. So, that's how it go. Like, you know, sharp and steel. You never know who listening to the music. Let's go slow. And when we yeah. did the four and five, like, right? the shit was regional, but it was people who was leaving all the college in LA. The college in LA. So who was in that four and the group? The four and five. Four and five was me, DJ Daryl, who was the one who was making the beats, and D-Lo was the rapper. D-Lo was the one who was saying groupy ass bitch. You know. So, and DJ Daryl, did he make the five? Oh, okay. DJ Girl made Ain't Gonna Do. He made 415, Side Show, all them stuff. Oh, stories. yeah, I remember those. That's what's up. And speaking of, I got five on it. That was, a, that was one of your big records also. You have many, many big records, but that was one of the uh, great ones. What was, um, did, that, did that go platinum or double platinum? Yeah, that, that five on it, the one that's put me on that record, that was a, a turning point in my career. I just came home from the half -time. I had just called two days. Called back to rapping after the four or five shit. Looney's put me on the remix. So that was a record that I think I got, I got a platinum pipe for early on. It was a double platinum. Shout out to the Punisher. My own young They gave me a platform. I 
Oh, yeah. 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 Against the world. And you said the game shifted when Gears and that when that uh, record came out. What was the music business like then? Like was it was it lovely? Was it okay? It was lovely for Bay Area. Like 40 years short and all that did shit with John. You know what I mean? Def Jam came looking for some talent that picked me up. So that being the industry was only And the big question we were waiting uh, not to just cut you off was, was, you know, you mentioned Tupac earlier. We, want, uh, we wanted to know how was your relationship with Tupac? Pac was a good nigga. I met Pac for a female named Teresa. Teresa used to be a chick I used to fuck with. She was from Berkeley. She called me one day, she was like, hey, let's do that. And I was like, hey, let's do that. And I was like, hey, let's do that. And I was like, So she was like, hey, I'm going to get you this. She said, hey, let's do that. So I'm going to get you this. Glass out here. Get over there. I didn't even know what that was. So I went to the email. You introduce yourself. You come and start fucking around. Start hanging from there. And then I started coming around. And this was like three days ago. So he was more on the black power shit. He was on the panther shit. The friend that's got a baby shit. He was still cool. And that's where the relationship started. And then he started saying, like, I don't want to do some music with you. And I was like, nigga, you know that black power shit. We want some gangsta shit. We want it. Right here. Because that's when he, he went on the gangsta shit. He became a friend of us. When he came to the town, I kind of showed him the ropes. I showed him the shit he wanted to know about moving around. Oh, shit, the rest is history. Yeah. So, uh, I ended up working with Tupac. Did uh, you ever have to do, like, do business with Shug Knight, you know, because, you know, Pac was working with Shug? I mean, what's, what's crazy is I was fucking with Pac before he signed with Shug. I remember him writing me from jail when he was in Danny Moore telling me I was about to sign with Shug. And he was asking me what I thought. I was like, I don't think you need to do that. You already got your own thing. You know, because you had to the world that when I was already, like, playing. But yeah, he was like, well, Shug was talking about coming in from jail. He was like, I ain't talking about that. So I'm like, you know, I can feel it. I mean, nigga, I haven't been in jail. I can feel that. So that's when we first start working. Sure, and I say this to a lot of niggas. Niggas have a lot of shit to say about sure. I don't have nothing but good stories to tell about that. Was he a good dude? I mean, every time I seen him, he was a good nigga. Like, he had a lot of respect for older niggas, a lot of respect for me. But the thing was, I think him and Pop they turned each other out. You know what I mean? Pop wanted that power, Sugar wanted that thing. Excuse me, the two got together and kind of like turned each other out. You know what I mean? But I don't have nothing bad to say about Sugar. Every time I was around him, he was a stand up man. Now, what he did with niggas' contracts and all that, that wasn't nothing to do with me. He was saying the way he was when me and Pac fucked with him, that nigga was solid. I remember one time, I remember that one time we was going on the water before we went on the water and we was in the pool table room and there was a plaque on the wall with Tupac, I think it was, I don't know if it was his, one of his raps on your wall, it was a real rap, you know, he talking about the contract. Remember they went, I did me against the rule with Bob and the label didn't want to pay me because they said we didn't have a contract, so I took a piece of notebook paper and I wrote out a contract and I talked about what part of the song I wrote and how much my percentage was. And then I signed it, Pop signed it, and then his mom signed it as a, a witness. And then I gave that to a lady, and that's how I got it. She was like, nigga, we'll pay you, nigga, we just need something on paper. And boom, well, once I put it up, I got the bread. Wow, that's what's up, because I know I was saying, like, Pop's oh, real handwriting on that paper. I mean, that was my guy. Uh, in this rap game, in the, uh, in, uh, in the rap game in the 90s, how is it different from the situation now and, and what's going on in today? Like, in the, from the 90s. I, mean, I feel like this, this is my take on it. They always say the first get it worse. And what that means is, me being a hustler, the first time I saw rock cocaine was in 1992. I'm going off the music shit, I'm just going to give y'all a lot of that. First time I saw rock cocaine was in 1992. So what I'm saying is Oakland had the code game first. Now, the code game is over in the town. 
you see niggas in the country, niggas down south, niggas everywhere getting money off coke. So, and off weed, different shit. So when they say the first get it worse, it's just like what that line Jay Z said. He said, We overcharge the niggas for what they did to the coke. So, <laughs> ever, you remember that line Jay Z said? Jay yeah. said, We overcharge the niggas for what they did to the coke person. Because the coke person brothers didn't get no money. Uh, Sugar Hill Gang, they didn't pay them. Every generation gets a better look at the bag. Just because niggas paved the way. These young niggas right now, you can look at the jewelry, you can look at the teeth, you can look at the, the movement. These kids is getting a whole lot of money now in music. What I see now with music is different from when we came up. I guess now everybody want to party. Everybody kind of want to shake, get away from the, the real struggles, the baby mama, the work. Whatever they're going through on a day to day basis. So you got this turn up music that you go to the club and you listen to, and it's turn up. It takes you away from real life. When we was rapping, we was putting the real life in the music so niggas could feel us, so niggas could relate to us, so niggas could know that we was in the same boat as they was in. You feel me? But the music is different. It ain't about message rap. Man. It ain't about putting game in rap. It's about how much good fuel can you put in the music. So now you let the beat take over. You let the hook do the work. And then the verses just... I mean, you got some of these new niggas that in the new verses still be talking that shit. So I'm not against the new music, but I know it's generational. The shit moves with the generation. You know what I mean? I came up in the generation when niggas was hustling. So I made hustle music. Now niggas is scamming. Niggas is robbing. Niggas is bipping. Niggas is jacking. So they putting that in the music. So, you know, older generation, like, oh, we can't fuck with that. We can't fuck with that. But I remember my mama telling me that what I was making was music. I mean, I let her hear. She said, that ain't music. So I get it. The generations be different. What I'm glad to see is that these little niggas is getting paid. Because they're getting them back. That's right. You feel me? And, uh, how, how was it? Uh, there's other question we have here is now. Um, how was it being one of the first West Coast rappers to sign to a Def Jam, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. I mean, for me, for me, that moment, for me it was big. I mean, Russell Simmons' Def Jam was like the pinnacle of rap. You know, Russell had the deaf comedy shit. I mean, like I said, once again, I looked up to niggas like LL, nigga, uh, motherfucking EPMD. Like, all of them niggas was deaf jam artists. Run the DMC at some, at some point, he was deaf jam artists. So to me, it was huge for a West Coast nigga to have an East Coast label. Get the nigga. Real talk. What was Russell Simmons like? A player. Russell and Leo. Shout out Russell. Shout out Leo. Come on, two dudes. And Tina Davis. I can't leave Tina. Though. Tina's the one who, she's the in and off from the rail. She's working at Empire now. She's the one who actually got me to do it. She heard my music in a hotel room one night. I was up in there kicking with 40 and Bima. I played some music. She took my music to the label got me signed. So it was, I mean, to be honest with you, I wasn't taking myself serious. If I would have took myself serious, I mean, I probably could have been, who knows how bad. But one thing about me, like, I've always been a, a dope dealer. Like, hand you the dope, get the money. That was my thing. When I meant music, music was like, make the music, put the music out, tour, promote the music, and maybe get some money. Yeah. So it was a time when you was like, you know, ahead of your game. Well, I'm not just saying you know, I was ever not ahead of your game, because you always stayed ahead of your game, but it was a time when you was the hottest rapper, and uh, then, you know, we just talked down a little bit about you, and then, you know, and then people wanted to know, was it record label problems, or was it the pressure weighing in on you being a top of Let me tell you what it was. I signed with Def Jam. I got spoiled. I got with a label who all I had to do was make the music. They was gonna put it out. They was gonna shoot the videos. They was gonna buy the billboards, all the shit. After I left Def Jam, it got to the point to where I was like, okay, maybe this music shit ain't for me. I'm gonna get back to the street. I'm gonna get back to trap. I was bitter with the music for me. Because I was like, damn, I didn't put all my shit in, all my support into this music shit, and it still ain't hanging out. Right? The thing was, it was just bad timing for me. Like I said, definitely was a good label, but they didn't know the West Coast. All they had did was Warren G. Warren G did for a million based on the chronic. He was Dre's brother. So they didn't really know how to West Coast music. So I, when I had people start telling me that season veterans should be platinum, season veterans should be gold, nigga, you should be this, this, I start listening to them. 